You're listening to the Vox Media Podcast Network. This is What the Heck with Mike Heck on MMAFighting.com. Now, here is your host, Mike Heck. What the heck? Well, hello there, everybody, and welcome to a brand new edition of What the Heck here on MMAFighting.com. I am Mike Heck. Thank you for checking out the program once again this week. The UFC is back this Saturday, a rare weekend off this past weekend, but they're back on ABC this Saturday, headlined by Marvin Vittori versus Kevin Holland, who is stepping in on short notice for the injured Darren Till. A lot always happens in between times we speak, and... uh, Kevin Holland is now in. Darren Till is out. I know our own Damon Martin actually spoke with Kevin Holland on Monday before the Trailblazer traveled to Las Vegas. So look for that interview. It should be out now on the MMA Fighting YouTube page. Great to see Bellator back at it. On Friday night, Bellator 255 went down in beautiful Uncasville, Connecticut at Mohegan Sun Arena. And it was capped off by Patricio Pitbull successfully defending his featherweight title. What a performance. You just don't do that to Emmanuel Sanchez unless you are a special, special fighter. Patricio Pitbull is a special, special fighter. What a performance. And now the fight everybody wants to see is next. My opinion, this is the biggest fight Bellator can make. Patricio Pitbull versus AJ McKee for the featherweight title. The finals of the featherweight Grand Prix. Man. That is a tasty fight right there. And AK Lee and I discussed the fallout of that event, how big that fight can be, comparing that fight to the UFC featherweight title fight between Alexander Volkanovsky and Brian Ortega for later on this year, and a whole bunch of other stuff we we discussed on on to the next one. Usually it's our UFC matchmaking show, but there was no UFC event, so we just did like a potpourri of topics and just talked about everything. So check that out on the podcast network. Bellator, of course, back again this Friday, headlined by Ryan Bader versus Leota Machida. That'll kick off the Bellator Light Heavyweight Grand Prix. Very exciting stuff. Liz Carmouche versus Vanessa Porto is on that card. The return of Kat Singano should be a good one this Friday on Showtime. And by the way, that open on Showtime for Bellator 255, heading into the main card, Right in the feels. Right in the feels. Absolutely incredible. So kudos to Bellator. Glad to see them back in 2021. One Championship is also back on Wednesday. One on TNT, one live. Right after AEW Wrestling, Demetrius Johnson challenging Adriana Marias for the Flyway title. Which, in my opinion, quite possibly the most interesting fight of the entire week in mixed martial arts, if we're being honest. That is a really good scrap. Demetrius Johnson, of course, we all know who DJ is, but Adriana Marias getting overlooked a bit here. That is going to be a great fight. Eddie Alvarez on that card as well. He takes on Yuri Lapicus. Another interesting fight right there. Much more. That's going to be a good, good event. So make sure you check that out. Of course, the UFC back this Saturday, UFC Vegas 23. A lot to be excited about if you are an MMA fan, but let's get into this week's show. Here is the lineup. We're going to wrap things up with my conversation with the great John Anik. If you missed it, I spoke with him on Thursday. He's actually going to be calling the action on Saturday on ABC. But we talked about the fallout of UFC 260, Francis Ngannou's big win, the big pay-per-views upcoming later on this month, and in, in May in Houston, the fans, etc. We talked about a lot. So that is coming up at the end of the program. Joe Selecki has a big one coming up on Saturday. He takes on Jim Miller at UFC Vegas 23, featured prelim on ESPN before everything switches on over to ABC. We'll check in with the new dad, Joe Selecki, a little bit later on. Speaking of one championship, Colby Northcutt returns to action later this month, and she'll be on the same card as her brother, Sage Northcutt. April 28th, one on TNT4. She takes on Sovinari M. First time getting the chance to speak with Colby Northcutt. You'll hear that conversation in around 20 or so minutes. But first, let us check in with one half of one of the big fights this Saturday in the UFC strawweight division. Let us welcome back to the show, Mackenzie Dern. All right, happy to be joined once again by Mackenzie Dern, who is back at it again this Saturday in Las Vegas. She takes on the number five ranked Nina Ansaroff at UFC Vegas 23. Mackenzie, thank you for joining us again, especially on Fight Week. How are you? Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. 
And it's good, you know, I get some interviews. I'm still at home, you know, so it's good. You know, I'm happy, I'm comfortable, and that's what's important. Absolutely. So when you and Nina get in that octagon on Saturday, this will be the first women's UFC fight, first women's MMA fight to ever air on ABC. And ABC has a rich, rich history in combat sports. Some of the biggest fights in history in boxing, more specifically, aired on that network. So how does it feel to be in this position, be part of the very first women's mixed martial arts bout on ABC? Yeah, I think it's um, it's great. And I'm so happy. I, re- I think it's really like going to make, you know, reach more people. And I think it's even better that we're both moms, you know. So it's like really, really cool. Uh, I don't know if it's the first like both recent mom fight into either, you know, but, you know, I think we're really like, uh, maybe can, a lot of women can uh, will be able to connect and identify some their stories with us, and we'll kind of really get people interested in watching, you know, women's MMA and and all these things. You know, I think I'm hoping the guys will be happy, like that their girls will like be excited to watch the girls fights, you know, and things like that. You know, they're gonna be like, oh babe, look at look at these girls, you know, their moms and all these things. So I think it's really, really good, and I know we're gonna do a great show for everybody. Is that something that, that, that is important to you to try to like grow the audience in that, in that aspect? Definitely. One hundred percent. I mean, I went into MMA because, um, I wanted to get women's jujitsu, you know, if I, I thought like, man, if I can represent jujitsu, like women's jujitsu on the big platform, that's UFC and show like the, how efficient jujitsu is, um, then, then that, that's the whole reason why I got into MMA and to the UFC and stuff like that. Uh, so now yeah, on top of that, you know, becoming a mom and still like showing, you know, you know, trying to like, you know, just kind of inspire the woman and and get them, you know, seeing that we have technique, we train hard, we can be moms and daughters and wives and all these things, and it's still go and kick butt too, you know. That's amazing. It's a very cool thing. And no doubt about it. another cool thing took place in December at UFC 256. Took on a very tough opponent in Verna Jandaroba. The fight was all tied up heading into the third round, and you come through in a big way with your striking. You listened to the coaches in the corner. You landed some big shots in that third round, and you used some great technique and got the win. I feel like this is kind of a turning point round for you, being able to come through the way that you did. What was that third round back in December like for you? Yeah, it was, uh, was good, you know, because I think, uh, you know, a lot of people, they or they grow or they kind of they don't um, show up for the third round, you know, or they kind of like the person that kind of slows down in the third round or the person that puts the pressure on the third round. So I think it's definitely more dangerous to fight someone that grows in the third round. And I think I was able to show that, that I'm kind of like the person that just gets better and better. When before people say like, oh, you know, just take Mackenzie out of the first round and, you know, pull her into uh, deep waters and then you'll do good. You know, I think that's kind of the strategy I have a lot of people who go to fight me is kind of to win on points, go to the judge's decision, um, you know, that go th- the three rounds. Um, I'm, I'm like always pressing forward, aggression, aggressive, you know, so kind of just to let me make me get tired, make me make mistakes and go to third round. So I think really uh, going into the third round, especially kind of like, you know, it was kind of who wants it more. Um, and, you know, if they want it more, they kind of have to exchange with me you know they need to get close and then that's where it's dangerous because you know i'm the ground i'm a grappler and you know they don't want to get close to me you know so i think it's um it was really good to kind of show like my the different levels i'm gaining and you know perilla boxing you know i was really excited to show and i think like you said it kind of would just turn the corner and i'm really excited to show you know what i've been working on and how i mean maybe i'll show it maybe not maybe it'll just be like really fast or something like that you know <laughs> but i've been working hard in perlo you know it's every day and in the gym and i think we're gonna show a lot of good stuff yeah it's interesting because like it was clearly vindication for those who who say like oh once you get mckenzie out of the first round she's in trouble but kind of having a fight and a performance like that, you know, especially with everything you had to deal with last year, like you dealt with a lot, moving gyms, et cetera, has to be a bit motivating knowing that not only were you able to prove some of the doubters wrong, but it kind of showed that the moves you've made along the way were the right ones. You know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I don't like, I try to, you know, inspire people, things like that, but um, I, everything is basically like me and my family, you know? So, uh, I knew going into the fight, I felt great, you know, like I'm so happy with the decision I made. Uh, this fight, I brought in my coach, my strength training coach from Brazil, Rogério Camões, 
Um, so it's like something that I, I said in a lot of interviews um, from my pregnancy till now. One thing, like first, of course, is my boxing, you know, trying to get my boxing better, you know. But one thing I've been saying, like, man, I really I lost a lot of muscle and I'm really trying to gain that muscle back and stuff like that. So this was like the first camp, thankfully, because of all the structure I have at the Ruka gym with Rilo, that like I felt I felt good enough that I can add one more responsibility, you know, which was like my strength training and add to my add the add one more ingredients, you know, to this like cake, you know what I mean? So I'm really, really excited, you know, and everything's just working out good. You know, I think people can tell I'm focused, like we're in here and for the big the big money, the big run, you know, we want to be the champ and we want to, we want to big, make big things, you know? So I'm, I, I'm excited about that. It took 11 fights for it to happen, but, uh, I believe that was your first broken nose. Is, is that accurate? Is that the first one? Yeah. Man. <laughs> the first one. Yeah. I, outside of sparring, never had any sparring, nothing, you know? So, so it was the first, first broken, in, broken nose and, um, was good. You know, like I really, I actually, right after that, I I had like maybe four, five, six weeks off. And then when I came back, I did like a training with TJ Dillashaw. He had come by and stopped by and he did like a stiff jab, boom, right to my nose and just blew up again. You know, I was oh, like, no. oh gosh, you know. But it was funny because my coach, Brill, you know, in the fight, I'm like, oh, is it broken? He's like, yeah, yeah, you're fine. And then in the in the training, I'm like, he's like, oh man, I think it's broken. You know, it was like totally the opposite, <laughs> his reaction, you know, I was like, what? You know, and then it wasn't broken that time. So I was like, okay. <laughs> So, so just do like sides. the opposite of what he says. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so funny. So now you get Nina Ansaroff, first time fighting somebody in the top five, like you, like we talked about earlier, fellow mom. This is her first fight since becoming a mom. She fought in Judah 2019, lost to Tatiana Suarez. How did you react to seeing you were getting this big jump up in competition as far as the rankings go? I was so happy and I was really sad because after I, I beat Verena, I know I didn't move at all. She was like my first, like besides Amanda Rivas, but Amanda, she wasn't like, we weren't ranked before our fight, you know, but she was my first ranked fighter, me and Verna, even though she was two behind me. And, you know, I kind of saw like people moving and things like that. And I didn't move at all, you know, so I thought like maybe I'd go to 10 or so, you know, you just want to get that the top 10, you know, it's like so close, but so far, you know, I'm number 11, you know, so um, I, I kept talking to Mick, you know, I said, come on, like any, any fight in the top 10, you know, I just want to move up. I want someone that's really going to like push me. Like, I don't want to get to top, you know, get to the belt fighting people like that are ranked, you know, I want to really like prove myself and the best ways to like show that I'm ready, you know? So really, um, when they said Nina, you know, I'm like, okay, Nina's going to fight, you know, I thought it was cool. I, I know what it's like, you know, I'm my daughter, she's going to be two in June, you know? So you know, I'm going, I went through the whole process that she's going through. And then when I saw like, okay, she's number five, that's, you know, I'm, I'm so happy for this, um, for this opportunity. You know, it's really like, I, I'm hoping will push me far up, you know, if I can get the win. Yeah. You'll be in the top five at worst, just outside of it. I mean, have you, have you thought about that at all? Like what, what life's going to be like as a fighter being in the top five or just sniffing the outside of it? Uh, just I feel like I'm ready for the champion, like for the bell right now, you know, just how focused I am. You know what I mean? It's like, um, of course, you know, I have so much, my, you know, we like fights and a couple more fights and everything is good to learn and get better, you know, but just focus wise, uh, I feel like I should be there now, you know, just cause I'm like, man, all I do is like my kid, my baby, my husband, our life here at home and the gym, you know, where, you know, I'm just watching the fights all the time. It's like, I can't even see myself in a different way then now, you know, I'm really, really focused and it's not going to change. And I think people are going to see like how, how ready I am. <laughs> I saw that one of the things that you've been working on for this camp, obviously with the strength and conditioning, but with your striking has been trying to improve the defense, like the slipping of the punches, the head movement, which a lot of fighters have told me in the past, it's like one of the toughest things to master. Like, obviously it's easier to hit somebody than it is to avoid being hit. So how much have you improved in that aspect and how difficult has that part been for you? Yeah, I think it's all starts from like getting punched with your eyes open, right? People tend to like close their eyes. You know, I always did that. Um, I'm always aggressive the attacker, you know, but, um, you know, it's it's all Coach Perillo. You know, he 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 has his picture in his mind, his art his artwork that he has set for me. You know, I don't even know what he has set for me. He obviously knows everything he wants to do with me, um, how he wants his finish, 
artwork masterpiece to be, you know. Um, so he's just always adding to his to my game and things like that. But really what I know, like what we feel, you know, is just people like always on the counterattack with me, you know, like, he, you know, get me to come forward and then the counterattack. So just really being able to see the punches and, you know, moving off of the punches and getting my takedowns off the punches, getting my punches off of the countering counterattack the counter you know and it's just how it keeps going and going and i'm trying i'm starting to understand like the whole boxing and striking now and it's re it's really really fun you know and definitely like the punches you see don't hurt you as bad as the one you don't see you know so <laughs> i learned that a couple a couple times during sparring you know so it's, re it's really good so the big question mackenzie is how do we get this thing done on saturday huge fight big spot like we talked about mom versus mom first women's ufc fight on abc how do you get this thing done against a very game very tough opponent in nina Ansaroff? um i mean it's just jiu-jitsu and i think the the submission is going to come with this fight you know she's i know she has good great great takedown defense um she's a striker you know my last fight i went the whole three rounds striking you know i think i proved a lot um but I think like really the the way to get this fight, you know, cleanly with no broken nose, you know, is to get it to the ground and, and submit as fast as possible, you know, so that definitely the ground is the way to go in this fight. Three fights in 2020, despite a pandemic happening, you begin 2021, first fight a month earlier than you had your first fight last year, a win on Saturday, like you said, put you in the top five, but I'm curious, like, what are your goals for the year? after a really successful 2020, like you think you like, you're confident you could go after the belt right now. Do you think is, is, is getting there by the end of this year? Do you think that's a possibility? Definitely. Definitely. For sure. Like I said, I'm prepared, you know, so, you know, the way I'm playing like tr strength training, uh, everything like, okay, if we need to take a fight, uh, like last minute or something like that, I think we'll be prepared to do that. Uh, definitely want to fight as many times as possible this year, you know, but, also two people who are going to like really get me closer to the to the belt you know we have like the champ with rose gonna happen i think next weekend and they have yan with i think carlos Sparza. so kind of there's a lot of things good that are going to be mixing moving around in the top four top five you know in the next couple of weeks so i'm excited to see what's going to happen there um i don't know joanna i don't know if she has a fight you know we'll see we'll see everything that happens uh, but definitely I think if I make it to the top six, you know, then someone in the top, you know, the top five. So, I mean, there's a lot of space to happen and I think we'll be good. There you go. Uh, who do you think wins that fight? Zhang or, or Rose? Man, that's a, that's a hard one. I, I think, I think John, I think John will, will win, you know, I, I think it will be a good fight. I, I know Rose has like submissions. I never seen John do any like jujitsu eyes and me watching her I think okay I'm gonna if I ever fight her will be to do jujitsu and I know that Rose can can get some you know flying arm bars tri flying triangles you know I saw her working on her uh, heel hooks and things like that but man the champ she's she's focused too man she's she's prepared for anyone anytime so I think I think it's gonna be hard to take her off the throne right now. Yeah, that's gonna be a great fight. Two last quick things. I, I appreciate you giving me so much time. One, I've been asking everybody about this because it's happening in a little over a week's time. Are you gonna be watching the Ben Askren versus Jake Paul fight? Is that something that interests you? <laughs> uh, no, no, I'm not gonna watch it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm too focused on what's going on with my in my fights right now. You know. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. And then uh, last thing. I saw this video that you posted. It was you and your daughter. You were sparring in the cage. She's running around. She's knocking her fist together with the UFC gloves on. That must have been like the coolest thing in the world for you, was it not? Yeah, it's so cool. You know, like it, it's crazy because like I didn't even know it was going to like explode that much. You know, so many people like liked it and it was like lots of people tagging, you know, and my husband and I was like focused on the training, you know, so I'm tired, you know, my dad's there and we're just that's like our day-to-day -day thing, you know, like we're just playing around and she, I have to, like I said, I have to like convince her to give me my gloves, you know, so <laughs> I can, you know, cause she wants to keep my gloves, you know? So I had my, my UFC ones there and she, and she, she hits it. She does like her own little thing. It's so funny, you know? So it's when I kind of, my husband made a little video out of it and kind of put it into perspective and I was at home and we're watching it. I was like, Oh man, it was such a good moment, you know? Cause when you're in the moment, you're like so tired. You just finished getting like punched in the face and she's bringing me water and all these things. You know, sometimes she goes onto the octagon, you know, with the ring and she's like 
kind of shy, you know, she wants to bring me the water and just, man, I hope mom like, you know, notices me here and I'm so focused, you know, and then I see her and I'm like, oh, thank you. And then you can see she just gets so excited to be like my little helper and just be there involved and everything, you know, so it's it's really cool, you know, but man, I'm it's nervous. I hope she doesn't want to do MMA when she gets older, you know, now I understand what my parents go through, you know, watching me get punched in the face. <laughs> That is a very interesting fight on Saturday. Mackenzie Dern taking on Nina Ansaroff. Nina's first fight since the birth of their child, her and um, uh, Amanda Nunes, excuse me. First fight since June of 2019 that lost to Tatiana Suarez. And that was the last time we saw Tatiana Suarez fight as well. But what a huge move Mackenzie Dern will make in this loaded 115-pound division if she can pick up another big win against the returning Nina Ansaroff. She'll be in the top five. At worst, she'll be number six, but she'll probably just jump right into the top five spot knowing historically how the UFC rankings work, and she'll be in line for just an absolutely massive fight if she can do that. So that's a good scrap. Really looking forward to that one. As we head to our next guest, who is also returning after a bit of a layoff, making her what-the-heck debut ahead of her sophomore appearance with one championship April 28th, Let's welcome in Colby Northcutt. All right, let us say hello to Colby Northcutt, who returns to action April 28th at 1 on TNT4, takes on so- Sovinari M. Colby, thank you for being here. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So I, I believe happy birthday is in order. Like, it's March 30th as we record. So yesterday was your birthday, right? That's right. It was yesterday. Thank you. I appreciate it. So how did you how did you celebrate the the big two eight. I know it's a different time in the world with the pandemic, but do you were you able to do anything exciting? Um, honestly, I trained yesterday. <laughs> so nothing nothing in the schedule was different. But over the weekend, like on Saturday, we went out to eat, uh, just had a nice little lunch with uh Sage and my husband and then Sage's wife. Just a nice little little lunch, but nothing too extravagant because obviously I'm in a camp. <laughs> right. So we'll we'll do the real celebration after the fight. Absolutely. So this will be your first fight since November 2019. And that was a a memorable day in your career because you earned your first professional victory. It was your one debut at Edge of Greatness. What did that night mean to you getting your first pro win? And I guess more important for your career and your development, logging that all important time in the cage and in the ring and the experience overall. Yeah, great question. I mean, obviously it was a huge, huge thing for me. A lot went into that fight. Um, I had been coming off of a pro debut that wasn't as successful as I wanted. And it was a two and a half year layoff too. So coming from a fight like that in the U S to an entirely new organization in front of the biggest crowd I've ever fought in, in a new country, there was a lot riding on it and there was a little bit of ring rust too. So, um, the fight, obviously any athlete competitor, I would have wanted that finish. I did want that finish. And I, and I thought I almost had it in that first round, but, um, I am grateful that the fight played out the way that it did because being my second pro fight, I needed that experience, especially coming from such a long layoff. I needed that full 15 minutes in there to kind of, um, show everybody what I was capable of, but more importantly, show myself what I was capable of. So, um, I'm happy to be back. Obviously I wish that it was, you know, would have happened a little bit sooner than a year and a half later. But, um, you know, I'm really looking forward to this one uh, next month. You brought up your pro debut against Courtney King. And like you said, it didn't go your way. It's certainly not the way you drew it up. And and listen, losses happen in in the sport. But, you know, making your pro debut and having it go that way and just hearing you talk about your first pro win. Yeah, Yeah. but it would have been great to get your hand raised. But having that fight go the way that it did, that had to have also been a pivotal moment in your career, because as important as the win was, would you say it was more important on your overall growth, that first fight rather than the first win? Absolutely. I mean, no matter how many amateur wins that I had with all of my amateur finishes, I mean, your pro debut, it not going the way that you wanted and ending up with the loss. I mean, that was, I mean, I didn't take that very well. I mean, but looking back on it now, I wouldn't change anything. I know now not to fight at that weight class. I fought way too heavy. Um, that's something that changed kind of two weeks notice. And I was just like, yeah, I'll go ahead and fight up. A lot of different things went into that. Um, and a lot of learning went into that as well. Um, I feel like I grew a lot as a fighter and I'm really happy actually that that happened early on in my career and got it over with. 
Um, I mean, I look at, look at Ronda Rousey and I use her as an example, her super successful career with how many, you know, wins that she had being undefeated in that first loss. It was like the end of the world for her, which it really did feel like that. Like I would hate to be in that position and experience something like that way down the line. So I'm grateful that I got that one out of the way, you know, it's done and it's over with, and I can move on to bigger, better things and focus on the growth. Yeah, that's a, that's a great way of looking at it. And What's interesting about you and Sage being on the one roster and and being a pro fighter in general, like a big reason fighters strive to sign with these big promotions is because they want to travel the world and experience new places and kind of stamp that passport. For you, you've been doing this traveling stuff forever since you were a little kid. Like you're used to this whole thing already, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, we have traveled a lot our entire lives competing in sport karate all over the world, but Asia is the one country that we hadn't actually been to before our one debut. So um, having one be so awesome to sign me, even as a brand new professional, I'm super grateful for that. And obviously I understand that um, it kind of comes with being Sage's sister, but I'm grateful for the opportunity and getting to explore all of Asia. um, That is so cool too, because that's a place that I really never thought that I I would even be able to see one day. Um, If you would have told me five years from now that I'd be signed with one fighting over in Asia, I probably wouldn't have believed you, but I'm really grateful for this opportunity. And it is so much fun, obviously, to travel and see the world, of course. Was there like a a bucket list item that you got to see outside of just obviously fighting was, you know, it was a business trip, but still like being able to explore Asia and and see all the different things that you've wanted to see for so long. Was there like a bucket list item that you got to sort of check off? Actually, yeah, the boat hotel was the one thing I really wanted to see and get to go and eat and do up there just because of crazy rich Asians. That's it. Um, (laughs) You know, before COVID, we said, um, you know, my next fight, I want to be able to stay. I want to be able to go to other countries that are close by Thailand and all these different places. Um, Obviously that's kind of not able to happen right now because of COVID, but um, I'm happy that I'm at least able to go and get a fight. So even though it is going to be strictly business this time, um, that's what we're there for, right? Business. And now you're, and you get to fight on this huge card on TNT. Yeah. This is this is yeah. really exciting stuff. What does that mean to you? Yeah, I mean, it's huge. I obviously understand the opportunity. And I know that um, being such a new professional fighter, I mean, that's huge for me. And then especially breaking into the U S market. Like they are, I've known for a while now that that was their goal to break into the U S market. And they're obviously signing U S fighters from all over the place now. Um, so I'm very grateful that I'm not only, um, able to fight, but I'm able to fight on such a monumental card with such awesome athletes as well. And then getting a fight alongside Sage is just like icing on the cake. It's great. (laughs) This is the first time you've both been on the same card, right? As professionals, yes. As amateurs, when we fought for Legacy before they were LFA, they had a whole, um, you know, Legacy amateur series. So um, almost every single one of our amateur fights, we were on the same cards together, um, which was a lot of fun. Um, obviously, getting to fight with him. But now that we've obviously grown and he's all, you know, done the whole UFC thing and is here, no, we've never fought as professionals uh, on the same card together. So I'm, I'm very much looking forward to that and. I'm happy that I'm fighting first because I get really I nervous for say. him. <laughs> I get really, really nervous for him being my younger brother. Like, oh my gosh, I get more nervous for him than I do for myself or my husband when we fight. So I'm happy I get to fight first and get it out of the way so that I can relax. <laughs> is there a part of you as like the older sister that's like, I got to set the table for him. Like I got to lay down the groundwork. I got to get the win and, and get the family Absolutely. momentum going. Absolutely. There's pressure. I mean, whether it was, you know, the other way around, I feel like you have to set set the the tone for the night. Right. So like, you know, I'm not even going to say anything if it go, doesn't go my way, but you know, it's like, I'm going to get that W and it's going to raise the bar and he's going to even perform even better. So that's what it's going to be. So you get to face Sovan REM in a few weeks, mm-hmm. four and one, four finishes, had a stoppage win a few months ago. Yeah. Pretty fun matchup on paper. How do you like it from a stylistic yeah. perspective? We are two totally different fighters stylistically. I mean, you look at us, height wise, um, what our backgrounds, everything we're polar opposites, which I do think that does make for a fun fight because looking at us on paper and then physically, everybody knows what each of our game plans are going to be. Obviously I'm a taller, longer striker. 
wanting to keep it standing on the feet and keep her at bay in that distance. And being the shorter grappler, what are they going to do? They're going to try to come in, clinch, take you down, and it be on the ground. So um, this is going to be a really great opportunity to show how much wrestling I've improved on with my cage work um, and to show stylistically that I'm a more complete fighter and I'm not just a striker as well. At this point, you, do, do you watch a lot of tape on your opponents or do you kind of let the, the coaches and, and corners handle all of that? Um, I don't consider myself watching a lot, but I do watch tape, yeah. And it does help that she actually just fought in January. She fought right. January 29th and she actually fought a girl that was, you know, 5'9 and a kickboxer. So it was great for me to see um, how she beat her, but what she likes to do and then what didn't work out so well um, fighting somebody who has a similar style to myself. So she kind of laid the foundation for what I believe she's going to do. Um, but even if I didn't have that tape and I looked at her previous fights, I would think that she'd be doing the same thing anyway. Being over at team alpha male, we see you on Instagram with Sage and, and uh, Raymond and even bald your eye favor these days, which is, which know, is pretty right? awesome to see. Hello. Uh, <laughs> I, I assume your husband, Raymond Daniels will be in your corner. Who else is going to be in the corner with you in Singapore? Actually, um, they're only allowing us to have one corner. Um, oh, really? Really crazy. And that's something that I um, haven't fully wrapped my head around. I know that from what I understand, there's st restrictions over there of allowing people to come into the country are pretty tight. Um, so they are only allowing one corner for outside people coming into Singapore. And, and you're correct. That is going to be Raymond. Um, that's going to be obviously a learning curve because you know, you're used to three. So I'm not exactly sure why we can't have two, um, at least, but yeah, it's going to be Raymond. Raymond's going to be my corner. Couldn't have picked anyone better to be in your corner though, right? Right. right? I mean, it, the whole, it's going to be a learning experience because, um, from the whole quarantine thing to, you know, all that stuff, it's going to be, it's going to be new. And then being in another country is obviously, you know, I'm wondering how it's all going to work out, but it's going to work out the way it's supposed to, and I'm looking forward to it. How do you think it will work out, Colby? I may, maybe not a prediction per se, and, unless you have one, but outside of just getting your hand raised, which is obviously the goal, yeah. what is the goal on April 28th outside of just getting the win? Yeah, I mean, obviously, every fighter wants to say, I want to finish her. Um, and I would like to showcase my striking. Obviously, I was able to show my striking my last fight. Um, I thought that I was going to knock this girl, that girl out and, and I did it. So I would actually love to get a, a KO finish. Um, but any finish I'd be happy with <laughs> ultimately. We mentioned Raymond and mm -hmm. you know, I talk, I, I talk to fighters about this all the time. Like in the combat sports world, it is very difficult not to not only find somebody to share your life with, but find someone who totally understands the complicated life of a fighter, somebody involved in the martial arts, and you right. two have found each other, and it is just amazing when that happens. What yeah. has that been like for you? And like, what have you learned from Raymond throughout your relationship, the courtship, the marriage, not just like in the cage or the ring or in the training room, but but out of it as well? Yeah, it's funny because we actually met through sport karate. So when people ask, hey, how, how'd you meet him? How'd you guys meet each other? I can't even, he can't either. We can't remember how we met each other because when you were saying traveling all over the world competing in sport karate, that was us and that was him as well. So he's known as like the greatest of all time in sport karate fighting. And so um, even as a teenager watching him fight, it was just, you know, mesmerizing. He was so entertaining to watch and obviously the best. And then um, I was able to, when I turned 18, to become, uh, I was able to be on his sport karate team. So I fought with him and alongside him as a young adult through sport karate. So that's how we met. So, um, you know, it is, it's very nice to have a partner that understands what you do. I, I don't see myself being with anybody that wouldn't understand that because it's, it's a difficult life, you know, um, from the countless hours of training, how you have to live in your, in your diet and everything like that. And just mentally what you go through as a fighter, it's really tough. So, um, having him makes it a whole lot easier. Um, and I feel like he, he makes me a lot better too, especially even as a striker, obviously he's in my opinion, the best striker in the world, um, that can go and translate over to kickboxing and MMA. Um, but he helps me bring out my karate side. I feel like, um, a lot of my amateur fights, I don't utilize my karate enough. 
and he helps kind of bring that out of me and uh, calms me down and everything like that. So he makes me better in every way possible. Yeah, I, it's it's interesting you say that because like a lot of fighters, they seem to have like this renowned definition of like what an MMA fighter should be. Mm -hmm. And having somebody like Raymond with you, he yeah. is promoting you being you, like being right. yourself. Exactly. Like I've had so many thousands and thousands of hours and of training, competing in karate. And it's like, um, those are my roots. That's my background. And that's what I'm the best at. And so I feel like when I was starting my MMA career, I was focusing so much on jujitsu and all these other things that I was like kind of losing sight of what I'm good at. And I realized that what I'm good at is, um, rare compared to what everybody else is good at because sport karate is a very rare field. You have very few people that can do it successfully. Raymond, wonder boy, things like that. Um, so I need to kind of capitalize on that because, you know, there's not many people that can replicate that, that can train for that style. What is it? All, all you, you sport karate people are just the nicest human beings on earth. Like wonder boy, you huh? and Sage, like where, where does this all come from? Is this just part of like the development and growth of the martial arts game through that road? I think so. I think, you know, taking karate as a child or whenever you did start, there's so many more fundamental values that teach, you know, your respect, your discipline, your perseverance. There's so many um, great qualities that are instilled in you in the real form of martial arts um, instead of just, oh, I'm just going to become an MMA fighter and, you know, you're tough all around. I think that um, karate is, is very humbling and it teaches you respect and, and all those things that come with it. Well said. Colby, thank you so much for the time. Looking forward to see the 2021 debut for not only yourself, right. but for your brother Sage on April 28th, which happens to uh, also be my mother's birthday. So family oh, connections so uh, cool. everywhere. You know, what's funny is I'll be fighting. It'll technically be the 29th over there in Singapore, and I'll actually be fighting on Raymond's birthday over there in Singapore the 29th. Ah, that's so, so funny. Great, great birthday present to him would be a, a win for me. So that's, that's the plan. <laughs> There she is. Great stuff right there from Colby Northcutt. Those, the, the, the sport karate folks, just the nicest people in the world. They're just so nice. But that should be a really fun scrap between her and Sovan R.E.M. on April 28th, one on TNT4. Very excited to see this one on TNT era begin on Wednesday night. It's got, for the wrestling fans, you got AEW, and then right after that, you got one. So this could be a very good way to Grab a bit of a new audience, a lot to like as an MMA fan and a combat sports fan over the next next several weeks. This week's going to be uh, a little bit wild and crazy as we move ahead to another individual with a massive upcoming fight. He returns to action this Saturday, featured prelim of UFC Vegas 23. He's looking to make it 3-0 inside the octagon since earning a contract on Dana White's Contender Series. But he's going to have to do it over a true gamer, a longtime vet, fan favorite, and Jim Miller. Let us say hello to Joe Selecki. All right, move ahead to our next guest. Big fight this Saturday at UFC Vegas 23. He's taking on Jim Miller. Let us welcome back Mr. Joe Selecki to the program. Joe, how are you, man? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. It's good to talk to you again. Good to talk to you as well. Before we get into the matchup itself, there have been some big changes in your life since we last spoke. You've uh, officially acquired the title of dad. Congratulations to you and your wife. Welcome to the club, sir. How have you been enjoying life as a new father? Yeah, thank you, man. I appreciate it. It's been it's been fantastic. It's uh, it's awesome. You know, it was uh, yesterday was awesome because it was Easter Sunday, so we were you know spending our last little, little bit of time together. Uh, uh, you know, just tonight packing, so it was like uh, really hit home of like how great the last you know, six and a half months have been. So, uh, it's just been life changing. You know, it's, it was like, everybody was telling me, but, uh, and then some, so it's just been awesome. And, uh, you know, I wanted to be more active, but it didn't work out that way. I guess with the the way the roster has been a little inflated. So it was kind of a blessing in disguise. You know, we got to spend so much time before I had to start traveling again, training and all that. So, uh, I was training all along, but it was really nice to not have to worry about, you know, somebody trying to beat me up in six weeks until, you know, she was a little older. So it's been great. There you go. And you've, it's funny because like you've always been a super motivated guy. You've always been motivated by family, motivated by giving back for the sacrifices your wife has made to help you accomplish this dream of yours of being a UFC fighter. How much more motivation is it now that you've, I guess, graduated to Papa Joe? 
Yeah. It's, uh, it's just very different. You know, like I was talking about it today, uh, with somebody I'm very close with. And, uh, it was like, I was like, I, I was always doing this with our family in mind because we wanted to have a family, but you know, I got to meet that person that we were trying to, you know, it was like, it's like trying to get to the UFC and then you're here. It's just very different feeling. You're like, wow, like, this is more than I thought it was going to be. So, uh, it's the same thing. And, you know, I think uh, I'm still really young, you know, I'm 27 years old. So in the sport, it's pretty young too. But at the same time, uh, you know, when I was at CFFC and ring and combat and those organizations, like I had this chip on my shoulder of like, you know, I was doing it for those reasons. It was me and my wife and I wanted to, but it was almost like this attitude of like, I'll show them, like no one thinks I can get there. I'm going to get there. Like it's almost negative, you know? And, and, and it was a great source of fuel for a little while, but uh, that's like a young man's fuel, you know, like, I don't think the 27 year old car even can run on that kind of fuel. You know, um, this is a very different thing. This is something that's never going to run out. So I don't even know if it's motivation, inspiration. Uh, I don't know what it is, but it's just enough to make me want to give everything I have. And with a positive connotation behind it, where like, I'm happy to do it instead of, uh, feeling back into a corner, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I, I know exactly what you're saying. Cause I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm quite a bit older than you. I'm over a decade older than you, but I felt like when my son was born, it wasn't like it, it didn't make me older, but it made me like older in a wisdom perspective. Like I felt like like all the cheesy lines my dad would say, like I felt them all. You know what I mean? Like have you kind of noticed that as well? Like you just feel like a little more sharper in the mind, a little more wiser. Oh, 100 percent. You know, I've always been very analytical and kind of like old for my age, like even since I've been a little kid, people have been saying that. But this is just different. Yeah, it's it really narrows in what what perspective I have you're like well, like our pastor. I think he's a really smart guy. Last year for the new year, he was saying how like he picked a word for the year, and he was like suggesting that you know you try it. And I was like, oh cool, like I want to simplify. I got a lot going on in my life. And then the pandemic hit. We really simplified. I was really hoping my family figured out what was important. And then this new year came again, and I was like, well, what what's my word going to be this year? And I was like, it's going to be focus. I'm going to focus very very strongly on what I have in front of me, which isn't that much anymore. You know, it's fighting and my family, and that's it. So um, yeah, it's almost like. I just find myself thinking about a lot, spending a lot of time thinking about that and what kind of legacy I want to leave. And it takes away from the glitz and glamour, which is stuff I never really enjoyed about fighting anyway. I'm not really in pursuit of that. Uh, and it makes it about what it's about. You know, that fear of, I've always had this fear of not making it to my goals or this and that. And it kind of puts those fears in the rearview mirror where you're like, okay, I was afraid of, you know, going 0 and 2 and getting cut. I'm afraid of this. I'm afraid of that. Not getting the next contract, whatever. And you're like, uh, my daughter's going to know I tried as hard as I possibly can to be the best fighter I could be. She's probably not going to care all that much about fighting. And no matter when it's over, whether it's 10 years from now and there's a title belt around my waist or, you know, I'm never able to fight again because I got whatever, something happened Saturday night. Uh, I know I had a great ride and she'll know who I was, you know, and, and uh, the rest is going to be a bonus. So it just puts it in perspective of like, you know, don't let a, I always said like, don't let a loss go to my head or uh, go to my heart and don't let a win go to my head. And uh, it just kind of, you know, exaggerates that i think of course you had the eight, you know eight months between fights it's the second time in a row that's happened with you but obviously like you said you've had this this extra time to to spend with family but it obviously worked out because now you're fighting jim miller how did you react when you saw his name on the other side of the contract i mean fellow jersey guy not too shabby for your third ufc fight right yeah not at all you know and that's somebody that i uh I love to watch fight. I looked up to him, you know, growing up because he fought the way that I would always want to fight, which was aggressive with submissions. And, uh, but it wasn't like that jujitsu guy that couldn't hang with the MMA guys. Cause obviously he's got good striking too, good wrestling. So, uh, yeah, very exciting. Kind of like the Wyman fight, but I wasn't, you know, I was, I liked Matt Wyman, you know, when I watched him on Ultimate Fighter and stuff, but like I was an active Jim Miller fan. So just another level to that. And he's, um, you know, probably has a lot more up, in his career left than, than Wyman did. So it's more of a, maybe a challenge. And not that that was a challenge at the time, but just looking back. And, uh, I think it's that I'm just excited to be, I'm actually on the level where I'm competing with guys that I grew up looking up to. And I think that's uh, very, very exciting. You know, I'm going to be nervous. Like I am for every opponent. You can put a no fight amateur across from me and I, that'd probably be more scary because I'm like, Oh, what if I lose to him? So, uh, every time I get nervous when they say who I'm fighting, but I'm very, very excited to, to fight somebody like that, especially in such a fight where, you know, it's going to break the record for at least for temporarily uh, for most fights in history for him. 
So you get a big fight, but on top of that, it is the the feature prelim on ESPN before the main card switches over to ABC. I mean, this is pretty cool, right? You get that ESPN shine in a big spot. Like they normally put the fights in this particular place to make sure that people change the channel and move on to the next one. You're there. How does that make you feel? Yeah, no pressure there. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, you know what? I really don't feel any though. Uh, no offense, sorry UFC. Uh, I hope people tune in as a result of my fight, but I'm not too concerned. But uh, it's pretty cool. It makes it a lot easier to tell, uh, you know, family and friends and stuff like that too. Like, where are you fighting ESPN? But now people are so keen to it because of the past. They're like, oh, ESPN Plus. I'm like, no, ESPN this time. Just trust me. Uh, but that'll be cool. So, and, and I think on the TV guide it'll say. Uh, my name in the info box when you click on the event. Uh, I know that'll be cool. My grandfather likes to see our name like in writing and like print and stuff. So uh, they get very excited about that. So that'll be pretty cool. How does your dad feel about all this? Because I know uh, he's, a, he's a fan of yours. He doesn't really get to come out and see you too, too much. But obviously with the pandemic, he's not going to be able to come out really and see you now. But how does he feel about the spot, Jim Miller, et cetera? Yeah, we, uh, we talk about it a little bit, you know. Uh, we Let's see. Uh, the last one he watched, and my mom had to listen. She listened from the room. He just was like, okay, everything's good. You can come out now. So I'm assuming it'll be more of that, you know? Uh, they're real supportive, and it's been great. Uh, and it's nice now because, you know, I have their only grandchild. So we go away for fight week. I'm like, hey, we kind of need you tomorrow when I leave really early. So we'll see you at 645 in the morning. And they're, like, so excited to do it. So, uh, you know, all, all camp on Saturday. Day, daycare is closed on Saturday, so Saturday sparring day. So, uh, that's become, you know, Nora and Grammy and pub up day. So they've just been really, really helpful on the department. Take as long as you need and do this. And, you know, if you ever need anything while you're away for camp, like tell us, you know, help my wife out and just, it's been fantastic. So it'll be fun to, you know, they're, they're like kind of a part of camp now in that sense. So they can watch kind of feel like they, uh, they did, you know, did something to help me get in there. Uh, there you, you go. Know, me. That's awesome. I'm sure they're spoiling the, the heck out of it, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, they all do. <laughs> you have to, I mean, as soon as this fight was announced and confirmed, and of course you're ready for whatever happens, but most people imagine this fight because of the styles you two bring to the table, there's going to be a good amount of time on the feet, a lot of striking exchanges. Of course, if this thing gets to the ground, it's going to make for a lot of fun between you and Jim. But I mean, do you sort of expect a lot of this fight to take place on the feet on Saturday? I really don't know. You know, uh, we have our certain template that we follow for camp and that's just kind of knowing the areas where we want to be in both departments, you know, if we're on the feet, if we're on the, or all three, if we're on the fence, if we're on the ground. So, uh, we know where, uh, you know, where I want to be no matter where it is. We haven't really planned for a certain amount of time because it's such an unpredictable thing. You know, he falls into his shots a lot because he throws so much behind it and he likes to grapple. So, uh, you know, I can plan to stick and move for three rounds, but it's a small cage. If he falls into his punch and we're clinched, I'm probably going to grapple, you know? So um, I think it's inevitable, though, that outside of something crazy happening in the first minute or two, we'll probably end up grappling at some point because uh, it seems like the longer the fight goes, he turns into more of a grappler. And, you know, I've kind of done that in the past, too. So um, that'll be really, really interesting there. You know, he's he's a heck of a finisher, but I think I'm a pretty sound grappler in every position. So uh, it'll be kind of a fun contrast of styles. I mean, I know I have my finishes, but uh, I tend to be a little more conservative on the ground, I think, uh, a little more positionally controlling. And he tends to be very, very dynamic. So I think that'd be a fun, fun, fun uh, match for me. You know, ultimately, we go out there for the win. We go out there to put him in the areas where we feel we can capitalize. But at the end of the day, I'm a competitor, and it will be fun to compete against somebody in an area where they're very skilled, too. Yeah, I was just going to ask, like, is there a part of you that is hoping that if this goes to the ground, just so you can have that test and be able to say, like, you know, whatever. I, I rolled with him. We had these great scrambles. It was just one of those, you know, amazing ground exchanges be between me and a guy like Jim Miller. Like, are you kind of hoping that happens just to test yourself? Yeah, I think that would be exciting. You know, I think uh, here's the thing. If he walked into to our gym on a Saturday and was in town at the beach with his family or whatever, coming to Wilmington, I'd want to grapple with him, you know. Uh if I was in New Jersey and I want, I want to grapple with him. So yeah, I think that's, uh, that's definitely something that would be intriguing, you know, is to see how it plays out. But at the same time, if I go in there and, you know, I've been labeled a grappler my entire career, if I go in there and keep it on the feet and out strike, you know, UFC legend, then, uh, that'd be great for my career too. So really no matter how it goes, I I'm just expecting that grind. And I, I, I say it every time and it sounds like, I'm just giving a generic answer. And I guess I kind of am, but I think it just speaks to the kind of guys I've been fighting where, and, and probably the kind of guys that are, all over the UFC roster, which is, it's not a ton of specialists. It's a lot of well-rounded guys. So, uh, we know that this isn't a guy that's like, Oh, I'm going to go out there and catch his neck and he's going to lift his hand and tap and just wait to tap. Like, you know, it's a tough guy. So we've got to, 
I, I really, really plan to have to work every single area and, uh, and fight tooth and nail for those positions to get a W here in a grind. Have you trained with him before? No, no. Nope. So I, I believe I know they're from Sparta. I don't really know where that is in New Jersey, but I know it's pretty far away. I'm like a South Jersey Philly type, uh, Philly area, like Philly suburbs. So, uh, there's like two different worlds kind of like those more, our guys down South Jersey, where I was from, were like team balance. Uh, you know, my instructor, John Hassett was the first team balance black belt under Rick and Phil Maglaris. Uh, and then I feel like once you hit central Jersey, those guys kind of like the Henzo guys or that affiliate, you know, they used to train like Almeida's and stuff. So never, never really crossed paths. But uh, I think I watched either him or his brother at a CFFC when I was like pretty young. Like the first MMA event I ever went to, which would be, uh, gosh, probably CFFC one. I think one of them were on the card, but uh, never trained together. I mean, and you talked about it earlier, like a, a win, no matter who you're fighting, it's always good for your career, momentum, et cetera. And I know a win, having that name on your resume is is a good thing for you, obviously, but that's not your your prime focus here. You're not worried about like where this brings you in the rankings, like how close to the top 15 this makes you. But I'm curious what a win over a guy like Jim Miller would mean to you as a fighter and as a person. Yeah, I'm hoping I always hope this every fight. I was like, oh man, if I get through Wyman, it proves that I'm officially a UFC fighter. And I was like, well, after the fight, I was like, well, you know, maybe he's going he's to retire soon. He talks about this and that, you know, whatever it may have been. I was like, nah, it's not a real win. And I was like, okay, if I go out there and grind with Hubbard, that guy's a grinder. If I can go out there and grind with him, then I, I know, like, I'm a climb in that. And then I saw them in the first round, and I was like, well, maybe I'm just like a technician. I don't have that. Maybe he had an off night. Like, and I'm like, okay, like, I really hope that with a win over Miller, I'm going to be like, oh, man, see, I knew I belong here. But I'm sure if and when that happens for me, like I plan, I'm going to be, you know, sitting at home on Monday in the gym going, yeah, I just think he had, I mean, I, I, you know, he wasn't feeling that great that night or whatever it was. I'm going to find a way to discredit it. But I like to think that it's going to really solidify in my mind, like, okay, yeah, I'm a household, household guy here. They know they can call on me and I'm going to go out and get the job done. Is it going to be one of those like surreal moments for you. Like, I know you're a fan of Jim and I know you're not going to be, you're, you're not going to be like awestruck by the moment. Like at least that's not the thing, but it's something that up and coming fighters have had to deal with over the years. And sometimes when they get in there and they see the fighter that they're a fan of, that they're competing against kind of messes with their minds a little bit. Like, is this something that you've had to like mentally prepare yourself for? No, I, I don't think so. I mean, I, I thought about him a lot this camp. Like I think about all my opponents cause they just creep in your mind. But, uh, I don't think so. You know, in jiu-jitsu, I've gone against some guys that we like, went against Gary Tonin and, and uh, you know, I lost the match, but it was a really good match. I felt, and like people still come in to the gym that like maybe didn't know who the instructors were. They look us up and I'll be like, I saw your match with, and I'm like, Oh, uh, Hubbard. Like, no, no, Gary Tonin, really good job. Like I lost, but like I went out and I competed. I showed up, you know, uh, Gibson saw same thing, like another high ranked black belt. And, and, you know, I think these guys are great, but once I'm on the mat, I think that fight or flight just kicks in. Uh, I would think, I would like to think that Jim Miller with no crowd, cause I'm a big, I mean, you know, I'm just a bigger fan of his, but would be the same as Wyman with, you know, 20,000 people there, whoever were there, that same amount of pressure. And it didn't really affect me in that fight. And the other thing is I train with guys that I'm a fan of every day, you know, uh, every day I train with John Salter. I look up to John a ton. I try to go after him every single day. It doesn't work out for me, but I try, you know, uh, got to roll with Chris Wyman in this camp because he's been at Jimmo a lot. And, uh, same thing. Like it didn't, didn't go my way, but I was trying really hard. It didn't slow me. Like I never stopped and went, this is why I was trying to, you know, have good rounds. So, uh, you know, I hope it's more of that. And I think it will be. What has it been like working with, with, with Weidman and kind of, I mean, obviously he's a very nice guy, very sharp as well. What is it like just kind of picking his brain a little bit? Yeah, you know, I haven't gotten to train with them like that because there's so many great 85ers at Jimmo. They all kind of stick together. Uh, got one jiu-jitsu around, but just getting to be in a room with that guy and pick his brain some and talk to him, I think it's great to be around guys that have held the belt that are such high-level fighters. It's like being around Salter. You know, another he's the number one contender belt. He's going to fight for a world title this year, I'm sure. And uh, getting around these guys and seeing that they're regular guys, you know, and uh, seeing that there isn't any mystique. They're just really hard workers and good guys, and that if you stick around them and do what they tell you to do, you're probably going to have success too, you know, that, kind of get in that rub a little bit normally this would be the time where i'd be like how do you see this fight going but you're not a big prediction guy you're just gonna go out there and fight as hard as you can and come what may but what can fans expect from you i'll go that route what can fans expect from you on saturday night before they change the channel to abc yeah i mean i think you can expect a pretty good pace it seems like in all my fights you know i try to come out there and get out get after it right out of the gate um that's happened in pretty much every fight i've ever had um then it's gonna be more of that you know i'm not gonna go out and be passive. I'm going to go out and, and be smart, but you know, controlled aggression. That's kind of how I fight. I, I 
I think I put a good pace out there and uh, a high output. You know, even in some of the fights where it's been on the ground, you've seen, you know, like in the in the Wyman fight, I threw like 180 something punches. You know, I'm going to be chipping away out there for the entire 15 minutes. So, you know, I, I put in a lot of work in the last six to eight weeks, and you're going to see six to eight weeks worth of output in there. You know, I know. It's not at the top of your priorities list these days, Joe, but I am curious because we are getting closer and closer to the day. But former UFC fighter, now retired from MMA competition, Ben Askren is jumping into another sport. He's fighting Jake Paul in a boxing match. This thing has kind of taken on a life of its own over the last several weeks. So I'm curious your thoughts on this matchup. Who you who you favor to win? Are, are you going to watch it? Do you care? Like, what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, you know, I, I definitely am intrigued. Uh, I like all that stuff. You know, I, I don't like... I don't like the crossover stuff, like in the sense of them. Uh, it's almost like the whole world, except for the MMA world, the whole world is bought into like these guys being real fighters and not to knock on them, but uh, it's not really that hard to, you know, it's not hard to be a pro fighter when you also had that fallback of like the millions of dollars that you already had when you got into the sport, you know? Uh, I think there's a special bond that comes in fighting where we all kind of work our way up from nothing in, in whatever, wherever you're from, whatever your story, there's a way where you're like, you all had to go through that, getting 200 and 200, and then, you know, giving it all to medical fees beforehand, that type of grind, you know? So I think in that sense, I don't like it, but I do think it's fun. You know, I think it's fun to, to watch. It's a spectacle. Um, we were just talking about it. I was with my boxing coach and we're driving back to Wilmington now to leave tomorrow. And I, one of the things I said, I was like, Ashwin's going to win this, right? And we're like, I certainly hope so. But I, I think because he, like we talked about, he's got the Olympic pedigree. Uh, he's a competitor and he has trained and fought with some of the best strikers in the world. So I'd like to think he'll tire him out and, and get it done by a decision. I really, really hope. Joe Selecki, one of the nicest people you will see in this crazy space of ours and a damn good fighter on top of that. And that's going to be a good, good scrap on Saturday, especially if that gets to the ground. Man, the scrambles, the exchanges down there on the mat will be really exciting. Can't wait for that fight. And uh, that's going to go down lightweight division right before the main card kicks off on ABC. And don't forget, that event on Saturday, early start time. The prelims kick off at noon Eastern. So... We're going to be in and out of there. I mean, it's a UFC event, so not quickly, but we'll have our nights to spend doing whatever. We can go out or, you know, barbecue, fire pit, all that stuff, and get plenty of time ahead. We're not up till 3 a.m. recapping this stuff. So always nice when we get to mix things up every so often. But uh, we're going to wrap things up with a man calling the action on that card in a moment. But once again, just wanted to thank everybody for checking out the show this week. A lot of stuff happening. This week, as always, here on the MMA Fighting Network. We get the A-side tomorrow. We get Between the Links on Thursday. Media Days for Bellator and the UFC. We get preview shows. The list goes on and on. Excited to hit the ground running as things are really about to pick up in the world of combat sports very quickly. So big thanks to you, as always. Big shout-out to Casey Lyon on the production, Jose Youngs and Alex Savas on the graphics and all the social media stuff. Have a heck of a week, everybody. We leave you with my chat from this past Thursday with the legend, John Anik. All right, there is a whole lot to talk about in the world of the UFC, and who better to discuss this plethora of high-level news than the legend himself who called the big heavyweight title fight at UFC 260 on Saturday as we saw the reign of Francis Ngannou begin. We welcome back John Anik to the program. John, how are you, sir? I'm doing well. It's always good to be with you. Was that only five days ago? Is that what you're telling me? Francis Ngannou's win feels like at least half a month ago, given this MMA news cycle. But a uh, lot to get to as usual, my friend. Absolutely. It's good to see you as always. Before we discuss what Francis actually did in the Octagon on Saturday, I mean, the feeling before and like every second of that fight, John, it was just intense doesn't really do it justice. Like there's intensity in every fight, but this fight in particular between Stipe Miocic and Francis Ngannou, can you compare the intense feeling to other fights you've called? Well, I think anything that is championship level brings out a certain intensity and anxiousness, right? Even, you know, from 115 pounds all the way up to the heavyweights, at least for us, because we are fans at our core and we feel a lot of those emotions, I think, that fans feel sitting at home, whether you have an athlete that you're rooting for or whether your team's in the Super Bowl. I mean, we feel the championship stakes as fight fans. 
But man, Francis Ngannou is special. There's no doubt about it. Even dating to his UFC debut in 2015, I think a lot of us felt like we had something special on our hands. And even if you go back to the knockout of Alistair Overeem, I think late 2017, and you see the way Joe Rogan and I reacted, we called a knockout. But immediately our focus shifts to the well-being of a man, Alistair Overeem in this case, and hoping that he is okay. So this is a special athlete. It's crazy to think about what could have been in terms of other professional athletic endeavors had he gotten off to an earlier start and had resources at his disposal. But 13 UFC fights to the surprise of some. It took him that long to be a UFC heavyweight champion. But Francis Ngannou is the best in the world. And uh, best of luck to Johnny Bones and anyone else trying to dethrone that man right now. Yeah, I was thinking about this, like, as soon as the fight ended, like, the UFC 220 fight, like, if Ngannou had, if this Ngannou had showed up in Boston that night, like, a very calm, composed Ngannou, and he beat Stipe, and then, you know, the different guy went in there and fought Derek Lewis, and then he had those, like, four quick knockouts in a row, like, this would be a completely different conversation right now. Like, we're talking, like, he would be the GOAT right now. Like, he would be the greatest heavyweight champion of all time. Like, has that thought crossed your mind at all? Yeah, and you know, that version who showed up in Boston in 2018 is just so different than this version. This version didn't exist in in many ways, shapes, and forms. I remember when Francis got to our fighter meeting in Boston three and a half years ago now, and he put his head down on the table. Like the dude was toast by the time he arrived at the fighter meeting because of everything that he needed to do media-wise. And as you know, he had nothing resembling a good training camp in terms of the preparation. It was a quick turn, obviously, from the Alistair Overeem fight. And, uh, you know, he's not the excuse-making type, but he never should have taken that fight. So now he has been living his life as a devoted mixed martial arts athlete for the better part of three and a half years. And uh, I think the results speak to that. Still not a lot of film on the guy, either for his coaches or other coaches to assess. But uh, he's the scariest power puncher for me in UFC history. And I think even if you had Anthony Rumble Johnson and Derek Lewis on here as guests, they'd probably give him that distinction too. Just the composure he showed, not not rushing anything, even when he when he had Miocic in trouble, like he was still very relaxed and composed about it. Like that was just something to watch. Like I, I, I we, we expected somewhat of a more composed fighter. We knew he needed that, but to actually see it play out cage side, what was that like for you? Well, his coaches deserve a lot of credit. Eric Nixick, Dewey Cooper, Kamar Usman's get a lot of credit, and rightfully so, for just being this calming influence who has a few buzzwords that seem to really help Francis. But I do believe it's going to be hard for Francis to sustain over 25 minutes, right? He passed this test, stuff to take down, got a takedown of his own. You know about some of his other offensive skills. But if somebody can extend him, even this version, I feel, I still think that cardiovascular strength is going to be an issue for him because all of his motions are big and they're high energy. So I still think if you can extend Francis Ngannou, there are tests that he's going to have to pass. But as far as what was presented him this night, team deserves a lot of credit for putting him in, in a position to succeed. And he deserves a lot of credit. It's one thing that we all know we need to relax. I mean, even when I'm going for a five mile run, I know I need to focus on my breathing. Um, that doesn't mean I necessarily do it 90% of the time. So good for Francis, good for the team. Very happy for all involved. You obviously call the action as you see it take place. But when Stipe goes for that takedown in the first round and Francis lands that Francis and Ganu like powerful sprawl. Like what is going through your mind? I mean, come on now. This was we were just like I, I was talking to John Gooden about this and I was like. I go back to Happy Gilmore when he lands that long putt against Shooter and Gavin in the Tour Championship, and he goes, "Oh, Happy learned to putt. Uh oh, right, right. Francis learned to sprawl. Like, what is going through your mind when you're seeing that sprawl?" I'm not surprised. Stipe's not surprised. Stipe came out a little flat. I mean, he'd be the first to tell you. And then there's some maybe some mental things or mistakes that he made that he sort of softly alluded to on social media. But Stipe was not at all surprised to see an improved version. I mean, he understands the professional athlete that he is sharing the octagon with, you know. And for those out there suggesting that Stipe should have been favored based upon the body of work or the first meeting, um, do they understand what we're dealing with in terms of Francis Ngannou and some of the physical gifts? Like, do people understand what we are dealing with? I can't I can't give you enough superlatives when it comes to Francis Ngannou, but I was not the least bit surprised that this was a much improved version. I think it'll be interesting when he fights somebody who has a more layered takedown game, a la John Jones, to see how he holds up under that type of pressure. But uh, I don't know, man. Every round begins on the feet, and you got to solve Francis. Like, those first two minutes are are absolutely critical. 
But by the time Stipe got to his stool in round two, as you guys can attest, orbital might have been broken. I mean, the dude was buckled by the time he got to the stool at the beginning of round two. Uh, so I don't know. I wasn't surprised at all by why, what I saw Saturday night. Yeah, there, you've, you've probably seen the narratives by now. Like, one, Stipe came in lighter than the fight at UFC 220. Two, the smaller cage. Like, he, obviously, Stipe likes to rely on a lot of movement, or anybody who fights Francis Ngano needs to work on the movement. But Francis was able to slowly cut things off when he needed to. Like, do you think that made any difference? Like, if, if they fought in a 30-foot cage, a 50-foot cage, a 100-foot cage, do you think that fight goes any differently? Well, it's a good question. Uh, I do think if you ask John Jones which cage size he would prefer for the Francis Ngannou matchup, he would unequivocally ask for the big guy. And I think Stipe would do the same. Even though Stipe was able to maximize the 25-footer against Daniel Cormier and use it to his advantage, I thought in this matchup it favored Francis. And I might have said this to you before, Mike, but Matt Mitrione used to text me back in the day when maybe fighters didn't know which octagon was going to be showing up to Mohegan Sun or wherever they were going to be fighting. And he'd be like, dude, which octagon is it? And especially for a heavyweight, all you got to do is back up a couple steps and your heel is on the octagon. So not a lot of room in which to maneuver. I do think it is a factor in most of these matchups. And uh, I think the athletes that don't account for it uh, could pay the price. But Stipe trains at a 24-footer, a foot smaller than this 25-footer. He was ready to go. I just think he ran into to the better athlete. And at least right now, I think overall, Ngannou is probably the better fighter, as crazy as that might sound to some people. Yeah, Stipe, obviously, one of the all-time great people, all-time great fighters, great champion, greatest UFC heavyweight of all time. And this loss, I don't care what anybody says, doesn't take anything away from him in that regard. But in terms of what fans and people imagine and draw up as a heavyweight champion of the world— like Francis is the definition of that, like the size, the strength, the look, his power. Like he's a super nice guy when he speaks, but terrifying to look at and watch fight. Like this is the definition of like what casual fans and like people who don't watch combat sports, when they think of a UFC heavyweight champion, like France and Gano like checks off all the boxes, is he not? Well, yeah, the weight class goes up to 266 pounds. And again, this lazy steep A as underdog narrative that that continues to be out there. Oftentimes he's giving up weight. Not always 30 pounds. When he's fighting like a Fabrizio Verdum, he's not giving up 30 pounds per se. But he's a small guy relative to the weight class Stipe is. So it's not all that surprising when he finds himself a very slight underdog when he's weighing in 30 pounds below the weight class's limit. So I'm excited to see what Francis Ngannou can do. I think the real challenge for him uh, is just going to be motivation and being w willing to put training camp upon training camp together because uh, – Stipe tries to be the perfect guy in training, like training camp in and training camp out. And, and Amanda Nunes and all of these fighters who have sustained over eight, 10 championship level training camps. That's a hard thing to ask. So I'm excited to see Francis title defense number one. You know, hopefully it happens here in the next few months. I don't need to wait till December to see him and Johnny Bones, but uh, we'll see. I think it's very exciting at the potential as to what the UFC has on its hands right now. Yeah, I mean, with this whole Nganu Jones situation, the idea of this fight and talking about it is much easier to think about and discuss and get excited about than it will be to actually put this all together because we've already seen what's been going on on social media with John Jones. So I'm curious, not that you have any idea what's going on in the boardroom. Are, are you confident we see this fight in 2021? Like, I feel like this is the biggest fight we can make, but I feel like it's going to take a while to, to get where we need to go. Well, I think there are two schools of thought, right? You strike while the iron is hot uh, or you take the risk of having Francis Ngannou fight somebody like Derek Lewis to try to capitalize on Francis Ngannou's obvious momentum right now. John Jones would be the only one who could tell you what his ideal timeline is. You know, I think for Francis Ngannou, May, probably July, you know, International Fight Week would probably align for Francis. I don't know if John Jones wants that fight in July. I think he would probably prefer to have more time. That's speculation. It's not even informed speculation. But again, the Derek Lewis fight, calculated or otherwise, is a tremendous risk. I mean, Derek Lewis is one of the most decorated knockout artists in UFC history. And if Francis is one in or a in terms of the power equation, you know, Derek Lewis is is one a. So I'd like to see Ngannou and Lewis, but again, if if Derek Lewis wins that fight, then all of a sudden Francis needs a W to uh, to all of a sudden get back to a John Jones fight that is preserved at least right now. So we'll see how it plays out. I certainly trust you know the greatest promoters in the world to uh, to figure out a way to get what could be singularly the biggest fight in UFC history done.
Yeah, I just want to see John Jones in there at heavyweight at 245, 250, just to see yeah. how he does, whether it's against Ngano or Derek Lewis. But I feel like Ngano is just so massive and we got to get this thing done. Everybody's talking about it, but John's a hard guy to please, man. It, it, I mean, he, and he deserves what he what he wants. He's been doing this for so long, but interesting times indeed, Mr. Anik. Uh, but no card this Saturday, a rare weekend off. On yeah. April 10th on ABC, Marvin Vittori needs a new opponent after Darren Till broke his collarbone. Kevin Holland, I'm told, is willing to get back on the horse after the loss to Derek Brunson. Are you calling that one on ABC? I will be there, yes. Nice little little day fight card on, on the American <laughs> Broadcasting Company. So, uh, yeah, that'll be nice. I think we got 8.30 a.m. maybe first time, first fight uh, Vegas time. But, yeah, I'll be there. And uh, for me, it honestly – um, it's really devastating for Darren Till. It's an unbelievable main event. Um, but I got 30 fighters that I'm prepping. You know what I mean? So not to say that he's one of 30. I mean, you can argue next to Vittori. I mean, he's as important as any in the 30. But uh, I got 30 athletes to sort of wrap my head around. So I'll be busy regardless of who slots in there against the Italian dream. Can we get you a, a yellow ABC wide, wide world of sports Sport I mean, coat? I went like, public what's going on? with the request, you know, as kindly as I could request it of our of our ESPN head honcho, Glenn Jacobs. So hopefully he's watching this interview and uh, we can expedite things because we got to get some jacket measurements. You know, DC and I, we fluctuate a little bit. You know, we're not always on fight weight. So hopefully we can get that done by April 10th. Yes, I'm with you on that one. So from there, we go Whitaker Gastelum, April 17th. And then UFC 261 goes down April 24th in Florida. Two, uh, three title fights, excuse me. You got Usman versus Mazadal in the main event. Full house, things sold out in minutes. How excited are you, one, for the card? And then to add on top of that, the fights, the fans, et cetera. This is as close to normal as we'll be getting in, in quite some time, John. Oh, it's all about the fans for me. You would think it would be all about this championship triple header, but I cannot wait to have fans in the building. We got a little taste on Fight Island, and we were separated by those hockey boards, as many of you guys know. I'm curious what the landscape is going to be like. Can I actually like fist bump some of these fans, even if my wife would be against that initiative? <laughs> I want the interaction with these people because they are the lifeblood of the sport and I have missed them terribly. I think I've missed them more than anyone on the broadcast team. Yeah, it's easier to sort of navigate things. It's very convenient to go to the UFC Apex. It's five minutes from the host hotel. Everything's in front of you. You know where things are going to be. But I look forward to being back on the road 25 weeks a year, uh, being with the greatest fans in sports. Uh, and it's not so much that it's a crutch for me as far as the broadcast is concerned, but I really can use that crowd to my advantage. And I look forward to having them behind me. And and obviously, no surprise that that the UFC is, is blowing it out with uh, with three huge fights. And, uh, you know, Andraj and Shevchenko might be the smallest of the three, but I'm really excited to see what Jessica can do, given her wealth of UFC and championship experience uh, against the seemingly unbeatable Valentina Shevchenko. So you'll be seeing me trying to give that fight some shine leading up to April 24th, Mikey. Yeah, that's a good one. And then obviously Zhang Wei Li versus Rose Nami Yunus is just is just a dream. We got the power and the the speed of Zhang Wei Li, the international appeal against the the sharp, crisp, unbelievable boxing of Rose Nami Yunus, who's looking to get her title back. I mean, this is the stuff that dreams are made of, John. This is like a fantasy fight for 115 pounds, which is a it's such a loaded division and it never lets you down. I'm waking up at 6.30 a.m. tomorrow to do media for uh, for a couple of Chinese outlets. We got to rip early in the morning, so hopefully I can put a sentence together at that hour. But it's been a while, right? And you talk about capitalizing on momentum when it comes to Francis Ngannou. You know, that's one of the best things you can do as a UFC champion or a high-level fighter is to stay in the consciousness of fans. And even if you want to say that uh, fight week for Kevin Hall against Derek Brunson wasn't a super productive week. He remains in the consciousness of fight fans and, and looks like he might have another big opportunity here on the horizon. So I can't wait to see Zhang Wei Li back. I can't wait to see Rose Nama Yunus on the proving ground, of course. You know, when people ask me, Mike, what's the most memorable moment I've had in that broadcast booth, it's Rose Nama Yunus against Ioana Yeon Jacek. And this is the division that is deepest in the women's game and by a significant margin. I mean, go look at the women ranked 10 through 20. I know you all aren't privy to the 15 through 20 necessarily, but go look at the top 20, 25 at 115 pounds. There are a lot of challengers waiting uh, for Zhang Wei Li. And by the way, I just watched back the fight between Zhang Wei Li and Ioana Yan Jacek. And uh, I don't know, man. I kind of thought Ioana might have won the fight, right? So Ioana's right there. And you know that that she wouldn't need much notice to come back and uh, and be in a championship setting again. So uh 
Yeah, man, we're in a good spot. I mean, when you see some of these media outlets lay out all the big fights that are on the horizon in the next three months, it is uh, it's a nice way to kill a football offseason, I can tell you that. Yeah, I have to go back and watch it again more closely. I, I actually scored it for Joanna fight night because I had to do like round by round coverage and score every round. I, I actually scored it for you on on fight night. It was but it was so close like this. No robbery in, in any yeah. way, but it's just one of those fights that could have absolutely gone either way. It's the definition of it. I think the helmet, the helmet kind of hurt Joanna by the end of the fight. Um, <laughs> and the guy was just watching it back at D.C. at one point in round four. He's like, oh, right on the bubble, right on the bubble. <laughs> I'm like, really, bro? Really? Um but yeah, no, I, I very much look forward to the future of that division and uh, to see if Zhang Wei Li can can defend this belt again, because obviously she was uh, she was taking the deep waters in that previous defense. Absolutely. And then we're going to do it all again with the fans the following month. UFC 262, May 15, Charles Oliveira versus Michael Chandler to crown a new lightweight champion. But we just found out earlier this week the co-main event will be Leon Edwards versus Nate Diaz. And not only is it the co-main event, it's the first ever five-round non-title co-main event in UFC history. So when you found out about this piece of business, John, were you as shocked as everybody else seemed to be? Well, this is why this is the greatest sport in the world. It really is. And yes, I did not see this one coming a mile away. You know, Nate Diaz is obviously strategic when it comes to matchups and fights that he picks. And he, unlike most fighters in the space, can really call his shot because everybody would sign on the dotted line. You know, I used to say to Dominic Cruz at 135 pounds, find me a bantamweight that's going to say no to the Dominic Cruz fight coming off a win. You know, unless you're the number one contender, you are absolutely going to take that fight. So there are a lot of different layers a lot of different wrinkles to that particular matchup. I love the fact that it's five rounds, but how about the fact that like the Super Bowl's every February and we know it, right? But with the UFC, it's like all of a sudden a fight like this can seemingly come out of thin air. It's six weeks away and it feels like the Super Bowl. Like I'm going to Houston, Texas. That feels like the biggest sporting event of the year. And by the way, UFC 261 kind of feels like that as well. So that's something that's very unique to our sport is that all of a sudden two months out, a sporting event that's as big as any on our calendar all year can just surface. And uh, Nate Diaz, Leon Edwards could obviously be headlining a pay-per-view. Thankfully, they get five rounds to uh, to settle their business, and it's a few short weeks away. Yeah, Oliveira versus Chandler for the lightweight title. What, do you, what are your thoughts on that one? Because obviously the – I, I think we all knew that the Habib train was going to was going to go to the coaching side. He's done a great job thus far. He's going to continue that on this weekend. But – you know, what are your thoughts on on this particular matchup being made? Because a lot of people are like, oh, where's Justin Gaethje in this whole thing? What are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, I can't speak to why Gaethje is not a part of this equation. I mean, certainly his resume is as good as anyone's. I think Dustin Poirier is the guy hardest to deny a championship opportunity, undisputed or otherwise right now. But he has business to uh, to attend to with, with Dustin Poirier. This is the fight that makes sense. And and even if you go to Dustin Poirier's comments after the win over Conor McGregor in January, Charles Oliveira was really the name on the tip of his tongue. I mean, he acknowledged that this trilogy with Conor for a belt or otherwise – was going to be completed. But Charles Oliveira, don't sit here and knock his strength of schedule. You know, whether it's Tony Ferguson with his extended winning streak or Charles Oliveira, the one that's active right now, you put together a winning streak like this at 155 pounds and you cap it with a win over Tony Ferguson. Charles Oliveira is championship worthy. And, uh, you know, I don't know that you can penalize Michael Chandler for the lack of UFC experience. I mean, he certainly maximized his first opportunity and did to Dan Hooker what a lot of elite level lightweights weren't able to do. And Chandler's so humble, he'll say, oh, Paul Felder and, and Dustin Poirier softened Dan Hooker up for me, you know, because he's a man of humility. But I am not somebody who's going to uh, turn his nose up when a guy gets a championship opportunity. So is Chandler as deserving as Charles Oliveira, who's been in the UFC since he's 20 years old? Probably not. Um, but I, I think it's a very exciting fight. I think it's essentially a pick em. I haven't seen the betting line, but it's a pick em fight to me. And, uh, you know, we'll see if uh, Charles Oliveira can keep it going. I think he'll be a slight favorite. We'll see. Yeah, I think you're probably right on that. And, and a good thing about Chandler, too, is when that phone rings and they say, Michael, you want to fight this guy in two weeks or three weeks? He says yes. And he was rewarded with this fight and good on him. I'm happy to see him come over, get that big win. And now he gets a chance to become a champion. This is this is big stuff for for a great guy in this sport and is kind of going back to the the Leon Edwards and Diaz fight as shocking as finding out that fight it is how I reacted to it. And as interesting as this news was, you can't help but feel 
for Anakin Florian podcast family member Bilal Muhammad, who yes. got his big opportunity to fight Leon Edwards. He gets poked in the eye. The fight is stopped and he kind of gets left behind here. So what do we do with with Bilal now, John? I know he's one of the fastest rising game show hosts in, in, in MMA oh. right now. He, sh- he, he should still get a big fight, right? Come on now. I love the game show, and we all appreciate the plug of, of Bilal's video podcast. Friday nights now on the Anakin Florian Podcast YouTube channel, I believe. But you got to give him a main event. I mean, that's really the simple answer, Mike. You give him a main event because this main event essentially got taken away from him. And I understand why the promotion is moving forward with Leon Edwards. I feel for Bilal not having this fight come around again. But I don't think he was surprised to see them go in this direction. Maybe he was surprised to see Nate Diaz kind of come out of nowhere. But I think the writing was on the wall in terms of Leon Edwards getting a fight with somebody in that top five or top three even. Um, And Nate Diaz is an outlier the way Jorge Masvidal is. It doesn't matter what number is next to his name. He represents one of the biggest fights in the sport, and you take that fight every day of the week. You just got to give Bilal a main event, and uh, I think that might get one of the elite welterweights to sign on the dotted line because it would be a five-round fight. So that, to me, is the way to make it right with Bilal, and hopefully he pushes for that because there's a lot of residue that comes with that that's good for a fighter when you're building yourself the way Bilal is. So hopefully he can, uh, he and Ali Abdelaziz can can really be forceful about that request because to me, if you if the Edwards fight doesn't come around again, the only way that Team Muhammad can make it right is to make sure that his next fight is a main event. So we'll see if they can get it done. Well, sir, we could go another hour at least with everything going on in the world of the UFC. Thank you as always, my man. Make sure everyone checks out the latest Anakin Florian podcast recapping 260. I know Ray Longo as always was there, but did did I see right? You caught up with the, the great Brian Stan? We did. I, so I, I only bother Brian Stan with fight predictions when it's a big fight. So I texted him before Stipe and Francis, and he was super convicted in his belief that Francis Ngannou was going to win the fight. So and then the fight played out the way it did. And Not that I was giving him a chance to sort of, you know, puff out his chest because he's the last guy in the world that would do that. But I just wanted to hear his thoughts on on Francis and and the evolution, because I think Brian was one of the guys who sort of believed in him from a very early time. And uh, Brian was not the least bit surprised to see uh, to see the Cameroonian finally break through. So always good to hear from the greatest living American. You know that (laughs) you're the man, John. Appreciate it as always. And uh Enjoy the fights on April 10th. Hopefully you get that that ABC jacket, man. It would be so cool to see. From your mouth to Glenn Jacobs' ears. Thank you, buddy. <laughs> Thanks, man. You're listening to the Vox Media Podcast Network.